the next speaker is Nathan Klein. He will tell us about geometry of polynomials in algorithm. <clears throat> yeah, so thanks. Um, all right, let me get started. So I'm going to focus on the algorithms part because I'm a computer scientist uh, and I study mostly algorithms. I'm going to start with my favorite computational problem. <coughs> it's called the metric traveling salesperson problem, or TSP for short. Uh, okay, so what is it? So what's the input? You get a set of points, which I like to think of as the vertices of a graph, and you get some distance measure between them. So it's a, it takes the form of a symmetric metric, uh, and I like to think of it as sort of the edges of a complete graph. So these weights on these edges just tell you the distance between them, the pairs of vertices. And your goal is to find a minimum cost Hamiltonian cycle. So the cheapest set of edges that uh, has a cycle containing every vertex. Uh, and this model is a lot of natural problems. You know, for example, if you're at home and you want to visit you know, three locations to do errands and minimize your distance, then this will tell you how to do that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the problem is this is the optimal solution for this instance. It's plus four. But unfortunately, the problem is uh, NP hard. So unless P is equal to NP, there's no polynomial time algorithm that actually outputs the minimum cost uh, cycle. And you know, in general, what this means is basically we don't know a better algorithm than brute force. So the fastest algorithm for TSP has time about two to the n, where n is the, the number of points. Okay, but fortunately, uh, in the 70s, Christophe is an independently Serdyakov, they showed that there's a polynomial time algorithm which gives you a Hamiltonian cycle. It's of cost at most three halves times the cost of the cheapest cycle. Okay, so if you're willing to lose a little bit on, in terms of optimality, actually can compute these things quite quickly. This works for any graph or for metric graphs? For metric graphs, yeah. Yeah, the general case, uh, there's no approximation algorithm for it. For any, this number uh, can't be anything in the general. So. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how this algorithm works, but uh, what I want you to remember is that it uses spanning trees. So it takes some spanning tree of a graph and sort of completes it to a Hamiltonian cycle. And uh, a big problem in combinatorial optimization was, can you find a polynomial time algorithm which does better than three halves? So a big component of approximation algorithms is kind of making the numbers as small as, as possible. And so this was, a, this was a question, is could you beat these algorithms? And this was the main sort of topic of my uh, PhD. And we showed that you can uh, by like a, a very small. <laughs> Uh, and we ho hope, hopefully one day this will be a little bit bigger, but who knows? Um, okay, and I'm not going to tell you about this algorithm either, but what, what I want you to remember is that we're also using spanning trees, but we're going to use uh, a kind of distribution over spanning trees. And this distribution will have some nice properties. And that's the only difference between our, our algorithm uh, and the previous one. And uh, what I really want to tell you about today is the, the key tool that we use to understand this distribution, which is called the, the geometry of polynomials. OK, so what, what is this field? Uh, it studies basically the roots of multivariate polynomials. And you study how the roots change when you apply some natural operations, maybe taking the derivative, swapping the coefficients, so on. It also studies how the location of the roots Kind of relates to the polynomial as a, as a function and, and with its coefficients. So you can study a polynomial in three ways, right? It's zeros, its coefficients, or its behavior as a function. And this, this field is kind of interested in how those things relate to one another. Uh, and it's kind of nice because it actually includes researchers in, in many areas. So this, this has connections across algorithms, but also algebraic geometry and, and statistical physics. A polynomial always real or complex or Yeah, so I'm going to talk about real polynomials, but uh, in general, you can think about complex ones as well. So I'm going to tell you sort of two of the very basic uh, tools that, that we like in this area um, that you might see sort of at the beginning of the course on the geometry of polynomials. So the first one, many of you may know, um, it's kind of a generalization of the fact that the roots of a real rooted uh, univariate polynomial interlace with its derivative, right? So the Gauss-Lucas theorem is let P be a univariate complex polynomial. Then the roots of its derivative lie inside the convex hole of its roots. So if I have some polynomial P, 
uh, say it has uh, degree three, so it has three roots in the complex plane. Then if I draw it, the convex hole of these roots, I'm guaranteed that the roots of the derivative of P lie inside this convex hole. So let's say I have a polynomial as degree 20, but this means I can kind of keep differentiating and I'll get this like series of convex holes that should lie inside of one another. So you get some nice pictures and, you know, this is maybe kind of why we call it geometry, right? There's some geometry emerging from studying these operations. This is kind of a first example of, of studying how the roots change when you apply uh, operations. <clears throat> uh, a second theorem, also very old, uh, it's called Newton's inequalities. And now we're, we'll study a polynomial which is uh, real and has positive coefficients, and it's also still in the univariate case. Uh, then uh, the theorem is that if P is real rooted, it has no complex roots, then if you look at this, the sequence of coefficients, they form an ultra log concave uh, sequence, which means that the sequence is at least as log concave as the binomial coefficients. And Newton also proved that there's no internal zeros of this sequence. So basically, if you kind of, so this is the uh, set of coefficients for a degree 20 polynomial, you can see it kind of looks like a Gaussian. This is kind of an amazing fact, I think. And it's actually very easy to prove. You just sort of take a polynomial, apply some derivatives, and then look at the discriminant, and you get this, this inequality. So this is a, a kind of first example of the second phenomenon of looking at how the locations of the roots relate to the coefficients. So let's go back to algorithms. Uh, and uh, as I said, kind of a building block and, and th something we used in our algorithm was a probability distribution. So let's think of just distribution over spanning trees of a graph with these five edges. So here's an example. Distribution over spanning trees maybe with probability one third. I take this spanning tree with ABC and otherwise I take uh, CDE. And usually when we study these distributions, they're kind of the output of some random process, right? So we don't kind of see them explicitly, but we want to study them kind of uh, as objects that we get from the output of an algorithm. So they can often be a bit tricky to analyze. And uh, this is why we turn to polynomials. You can associate every probability distribution with some multivariate polynomial. And uh, you can see how to do this just in this example. So the generating polynomial of mu it's just one third times Z A B C uh, Z A Z B C C and plus two thirds times Z C Z B Z E. Right. So you can kind of guess what the, the general thing is here. I just kind of sum over all the sets and I multiply their probability times the product of the Z I for every I in this set. So in this case, I've made a variable for every edge of the graph. Right. This allows me to now translate questions about probability into questions about uh, polynomials. And a very important definition uh, in this arena is real stability. So we say a polynomial is real stable if it has real coefficients. And the polynomial never vanishes when I plug in values with all positive imaginary part. So in other words, it has no zeros in the upper half of the complex plane. And this is an important class of polynomials. It's played many sort of critical roles. For example, in Gerwitz's proof of the van der Waarden conjecture and uh, Marcus Spielman and Shubhasava's recent work on the Caddis and Singer problem. These are powerful, this is a kind of powerful idea to look at these things. And for us, it's useful because Orsea, Brandon, and Liggett prove, among many other useful things, that if mu is a lambda uniform distribution over spanning trees, then it's generating polynomial is real stable. So it has this zero free region. But it's not Sorry. What means lambda? Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I'm not going to define it, uh, <laughs> but I'll, I'll tell you that this is the distribution we use in our algorithm for TSP. Just, uh, yeah. but it does have a very simple description, so I, maybe I should, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it out for now. So this is what allows us to kind of use this link uh, between uh, our distribution and, and polynomials. So let's see now how we can apply Newton's inequalities to better understand uh, distributions with real stable generating polynomials. So let's say we know now if G mu is real stable, Newton's inequalities tells us that the random variable that studies the size of the output, the number of elements you get when you sample from this distribution, 
forms has a ultra log concave uh, rank sequence. So if you look at the sequence of numbers, the probability of the output is size one, size, size, size zero, size one up to size D, then uh, this behaves exactly the same as the coefficients of a real rooted polynomial with uh, real, yeah, positive coefficients. Uh, and the reason this is true is that, well, if you look at the generating polynomial of uh, X, actually the same as diagonalizing the generating polynomial of mu and just setting all the variables to be equal. Because now you get some univariate polynomial and the real stability in the univariate case, because uh, complex roots come in conjugate pairs, it's the same as uh, real rootedness. But then you apply Newton's inequalities and you get that the sequence of numbers is ultra log concave. Just one question. Yeah. What's S here? S, good question. So S is, is the thing that I'm sampling for my distribution mu. So it's a random variable with values in spanning trees. Uh, yeah, so X is going to measure the size of this output, and you can think of S as the, the spanning tree I'm sampling, yeah. When the measure is the length, the total length of... Uh, no, so th this, right, so great question. So I'll, it'll make more sense in a second, but for spanning trees, this theorem simply says that the number of edges in the spanning tree is concentrated, which is a trivial fact because it's always the same. So I'll say in a second why it's interesting. Yeah. But good, good question. But what this says is that if I have a strongly rallied, or if I have a, a distribution with a real stable generating polynomial, then it's kind of very strongly concentrated around its expectation. And uh, a consequence, maybe answering this question, is that if I take any set of edges uh, in a distribution over spanning trees uh, with this uh, lambda uniform property, then the number of edges the tree actually samples from that set is highly concentrated. So if I, for example, if I look at the degree of a vertex, it's very likely close to the expected degree. And this is extremely useful in thinking about algorithms. Let's look at now uh, Gauss-Lucas. Why is this useful? It tells us that if you have a real stable, uh, uh, distribution with a real stable generating polynomial, then the generating polynomial of the conditional distribution, which I condition some element to be in the output, to i being in the output, is also real stable. Why? Well, if you look at the generating polynomial of this conditional distribution, it's actually just the generating polynomial of mu differentiated with respect to uh, zi. And then uh, with uh, just one minute of work, you, you can apply Gauss-Lucas and say that as long as your original polynomial was real stable, so is this uh, derivative. And so this lets me say that actually the, the Newton identities also hold in conditional measures, which allows us to think about much more complicated events, right? And I can condition on some variables and then, and then still have, have uh, concentration. So thanks a lot. That's, that's all I wanted to say.